Well, hello everyone again. Uh, for those of you who are going to tune in for this live broadcast, or those of you who are going to listen to it uh, offline at some later date, uh, thank you again for joining me. I'm Simon Devitt, uh, and this is episode four of Meet the Aquanics. Uh, I'm happy to announce that uh, in the last week uh, we have bundled uh, these these live YouTube streams, and they're now available on SoundCloud and they're now available on iTunes. Um, I've put links uh, in the low bar below. Uh, please subscribe and please share these. I, I hopefully think that this uh, um, podcast will continue. Uh, originally, it was designed to support the Kickstarter uh, in Maquonics, but I, I think there is some value uh, to continue this uh, beyond that Kickstarter, and hopefully we will average uh, one, if we're lucky, two people from the field of quantum information and quantum computing per week. Um, so luckily today, um, we're blessed to be joined by uh, Dr. Mark Everett uh, from the University of Loughborough in the UK. Um, Mark is a senior lecturer and the founder of the, the, the quantum, sorry, let me get this right, the Quantum System Engineering Group, is that correct? Yes, yeah, Quantum Systems Engineering Research Group, yeah, that's us. Yes, uh, which has now been set up as a part of uh, the group at the University of Loughborough. Uh, so thank you very much, Mark, for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. No problem. Uh, so this is a bit of uh, a bit of a tangent from our last three conversations. Our last three conversations were definitely involved with people who are um, very much in the, the theoretical and experimental um, hornet's nest of building quantum computing technology. Mark, you're much more on sort of the foundations front, sort of what quantum mechanics is, what it means, um, and how it relates to you know the, the universe at large, sort of the kind of the discussions that that usually drives me mad. Um, but this is really your sort of bread and butter, right? Yeah. Well, there's that side, and obviously the systems engineering bit, which is a bit. It's my venture into the applied. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I got interested in quantum mechanics because it's a mess. Um, basically, um, it was one of those, yeah, I, I, I suppose it's the choice, isn't it? You have two main branches of physics. You've got the relativity side, you've got quantum mechanics, and maybe unification of the two. Um, relativity always struck me as a bit too beautiful and elegant and complete and hard to do anything with. But, <laughs> and, and, and quantum mechanics is, is exactly the opposite. Um, it's, a, it's a real mess of theory. Um, and that's what makes it so interesting. It's also the most successful theory you've ever had in terms of application. Sure. So, I mean, it's sort of to give basically a sort of a bit of a rounded overview. First of all, sort of try and give me a little bit of a narrative as sort of what forced you in this direction. And secondly, for people who, who don't really know what it is, people might have heard of things like the many worlds interpretation, the Copenhagen interpretation, all this kind of stuff. What is foundations? What is foundations in quantum theory? Oh, well, that's, that's a really good question. I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer that, to be honest, because if we're going to keep this accessible to a... I, 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 and I'm trying to keep what I say accessible to a general audience. Oh, of course. And, we can't do much in 40 minutes. And also, I, mean, I, I may occasionally slip into big words, so if I do, please correct me, sorry. I'll pull you back. Um, so there, there's phrases like ontology, so the, th the underlying theory of, it, of what the quantum mechanics is, what the nature of the wave function is. All these sort of things have, have plagued people in quantum mechanics since the early days, with all the discussions with Einstein, Bohr, and the rest, and, and the various debates of Copenhagen. Um, so, the, the the real issue with quantum mechanics is we have a mathematical theory from the view of, if you want to use the philosophical language, of a positivist in terms of outcomes of experiments. Quantum mechanics is incredibly successful. Um, the trouble is, is there's more than one way to interpret the mathematics, the theoretical structure. Mm -hmm. And they can be very deeply different and they can play on people's ideas of determinism, which then leads down to the emotional connection to free will and all this sort of stuff. And that ends up being quite a bit of a distraction because... At the end of the day, all these different interpretations are interpretations of the same mathematics. So they, the, 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 the predictions of what will happen in experiment don't differ. Mm -hmm. 
So the, the real question is, I suppose at one point, why is interpretation of quantum mechanics important at all? Why don't we just uh, uh, and shut up and calculate? Um, and the reason that the foundations are important, not within the operation of quantum mechanics itself, but when we think about extending the theory. So if we, you know, so general relativity isn't a complete theory because it doesn't do quantum. Quantum mechanics isn't a complete theory because it doesn't do gravity. Um, at some point we want to unify them. Um, now, at that point it becomes interesting to ask what are the axiomatic foundations of quantum mechanics? What are, what are the core assumptions we make? And the reason I'm interested in is I think we may have too many. Too many axioms of a quantum mechanics. There, there may be too many axioms. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you look at Einstein's um, methodology in moving from classical mechanics to special relativity to general relativity, his program, his genius was essentially having the courage to throw away assumptions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, that was his, that's what he did that was so very impressive. You know? um, abandoning the Galilean transform the, the transform of two, the obvious trans, so if you have one reference frame and another reference frame moving next to it with constant velocity, there's a very simple set of mathematical rules you could do to describe one set of coordinates from one reference frame in the other reference frame. So it's like when, when, when you're driving a car and what do you see the other car coming towards you? Yeah. What speed is that other car coming towards you at? Yeah. Or the other ex example is you're in a train and you've got a gun and you fire a bullet in front of you. And if your, your train is traveling at 60 miles an hour, the bullet travels at 300 miles an hour from when you fire it from the gun, someone standing on the embankment might see that bullet travel at 360 miles an hour because you just have the velocities. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that's wrong. Well, in the context of special relativity. In the context of special relativity. Mm -hmm. um, so, that, that transform, so addition of velocities, velocities don't add as you expect them to. Um, and, and where Einstein had, and a few of the others around that time had, had this, this real courage was the ability to take these ingrained views and, and if you like, prejudices of, of the world around them and abandon them and then see what happened. Right, so basically abandoning what seems obviously intuitive. And saying, well, you know, let's get rid of this and see what happens. Yeah. Um, now, the trouble with quantum mechanics is not very much is intuitive at all. No. So, I mean, just to clarify, I mean, when you say axioms of quantum mechanics, these are these are postulates that we, we say these are true. We're not yeah. going to prove them. We're just going to assume that they're true from the start and see what happens. So whenever you set up a theory, your theory has a set of core assumptions. They may be... You may... If you're, if you're clear in your mind, you may be able to explicitly state them. Sometimes they're implicit assumptions, but nevertheless, any theory we have, any model, has a set of assumptions behind them. Mm -hmm. Now, the trouble is, is what you can actually have is... Um, well, you said so too many. You can, you can have too many assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, so you've over-specified the system, and what that means is essentially... Ah, no, let me come back to that. Okay. But you can also, you can, you can build your assumptions up in different orders. So it's not, in something like quantum mechanics, it's not actually clear what the core um, assumptions are. So, for example, quantum dynamics is governed by something called the Schrodinger equation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just a mathematical equation that tells you about the dynamics of quantum systems. Um, in some texts, some people will treat that equation as a postulate in its... You know, some people will do this. Okay, so you this mean a posture, you mean an axiom? Or? An axiom. Right. Okay. Um, but you can build that equation out of other postulates. So you, you can do it one way or the other. So, there's a, there's a, so for example, um, you can, um, because of the structure of this equation, I'll try and keep this basic. Sure. Um, there is, you, you, there is, you can deduce from the Schrodinger equation that within the initial state of your quantum system is sufficient information to determine all future states, mm -hmm. which is very different from classical physics. In classical physics, you don't just need to know, say, the position of a set of particles at the beginning of a dynamic. Mm -hmm. 
you need to know their velocities as well right in order to completely specify the system with a quantum system you don't need to know the if you like the velocity of the quantum state you just need to know the state itself and that contains all the information you need for future dynamics right now, so it's this 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 idea in quantum mechanics that there is there is a state to the system and that the state itself describes any possible property of the system yeah um so the, the fact that that state contains all information needed for future dynamics can either be a postulate on its own mm -hmm. or it could be a consequence of the Schrodinger equation which right. there's a priority issue here so it, it's not immediately clear which is the more fundamental of those two postulates mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you can take that so you could take the assumption the, there's enough information in the state vector to determine, determine all future evolution, plus a few other assumptions, um, such as the principle of superposition, superposition. And from that, you can you can mo you can derive the Schrodinger equation from a set of, if you like, other axioms. So, which is, which are the right axioms? The Schrodinger equation is an axiom, or the other choices of postulates that might lead you to the Schrodinger equation. So, I mean, how, do, how does that formulate when it comes to things like Occam's razor as to it, it's, it's, it's a better choice in principle to ch choose the fewest number of axioms that you need rather than multiplying the choices of axioms that you need to formulate? Or do you take the simplest axioms? Well, it's simple. Because um, you could take, so, um, I would be, my, my gut instinct says to go towards not having the Schrodinger equation as an axiom, but have it as a corollary of other postulates. Mm -hmm. And you think, think they're simpler? I think that's simpler. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. And, and, until, and the trouble is, until we can actually experimentally distinguish, you know, the, what we end up with is a model, we can do experiments. And the only way we're going to be able to, to distinguish any of these foundational views is to be able to do experiments that discriminate between them. Mm -hmm. So what that means that we would have to do is basically take possible axiomatic sets that all lead to quantum mechanics, throw away some axioms, mm -hmm. make some physical predictions that differ a bit, and experimentally test and see which way nature wants to go. Right. right. Uh, what is nature doing? And if you can follow that formulism, so for example, some of the axioms that don't fit well within the rest of the axioms are the ones to do with measurement. For various technical reasons, they just don't sit nicely with the other axioms. Right. Um, you know, they don't follow Schrodinger dynamics. They don't follow the dynamics of the Schrodinger equation. So it doesn't quite fit with everything else. All of a sudden, you've had to bolt on. Um, so I suppose it gets back down to, I mean, from the general public's point of view, at least for people who have some knowledge of quantum or, or some, at least they've read about it. I, I suppose the two most famous interpretations of this model is the original Copenhagen interpretation, which is you have this thing called measurement that is just sort of like a magic box. You bolt it on, all the rules of quantum mechanics are suspended for a brief period of time for this measurement to occur. And that yeah. turns the quantum into the classical. And then you've got the many worlds interpretation, which is obviously um, uh, favoured by a lot of people in the public because, and I agree with this, it's cooler, it's more interesting. Um, uh, you're not so, a fan of either of them. <coughs> well, I saw it say, my view is they all have equal merit until you can distinguish between them because the mathematical model they produce is the same. Right. So whether or not... Um, so, and for people, often people misunderstand many worlds. And I seem to remember there's some nice videos by David Deutsch, mm -hmm. uh, on computation, where he actually explains this quite nicely. So, I, if I can find the link, I'll, I'll see if I can post it on here afterwards. Can I do that? Yeah, I mean, you can send me the link, and I, I can post it in the comment section. Yeah. Um, I'll try and dig those out if they're still available. But he he explains many worlds in quite a nice way. I um, mean, his book, what is it, the the fabric of reality? most of his arguments are laid out in there, right? I've not read it, actually, to be honest. No, neither have I. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but I, I think to favour 
an interpretation is not the right way to go because until we can distinguish between them, they're, they're all valid. The reason that interpretations are important is that they lead you to different other physical models. So if you are a realist, a quantum realist, where you want to view the, the, the wave function as a real thing, mm -hmm. then you're definitely going to err towards throwing away the measurement axioms. Like I say, this projective measurement, this collapse of the wave function, you want to throw that away. But if you throw that away, um, the thing that you have to do is then reproduce what those measurement axioms did in the physical situations where we know that they work well. Right. Because otherwise, you can't, you can't just chuck them out. Um, so that, that, that should then be uh, the part of the program of the realist. But you get other, in, so you then, uh, what's this? I'm struggling to put words to this. Um, no, it's, it's a complicated problem. It's, that's why we're talking. Um, but even, so one of, one of, the, one of the places that, the, that you can take this sort of argument is within this decoherence program where the argument is that the noise and presence of an environment of other junk around your quantum device is the thing that makes this measurement type process happen. Mm -hmm. okay. so it's this quantum to classical boundary. It's, it's decoherence, it's an interaction with an environment that actually causes a quantum system to behave classically. Yes. But the trouble with all these, and I, I've published in this myself, so and this is a a fault with where I, you know, my own arguments as well. So this is this is a blanket criticism of these decoherence approaches. Is that the, we derive these equations from the full quantum equation, the Schrödinger equation for um, our total system and the environment and the universe as a whole, and then we try and reduce it to just looking at the bit that we're interested in. Mm -hmm. And we end up with these models that are other big mathematical equations, um, which represent this so-called environmental decoherence, this environmental noise. Right. The trouble is, is in doing that, there's a lot of approximations that are made, and it's not exactly the same. It's not, there's a, there's a bit of non-quantumness that's crept in, if you like. So you think it, it, it's, it's sort of trying to address foundations, but not quite, that it's a little bit... It doesn't quite do it. So what, what you basically end up with, what I would term non-Schrodinger evolution in there. There's a little bit of stuff that's not quite the same as the normal equations for, for a fully quantum mechanical system. Right. Now, that could come in, so then, then you're sort of, then you're sort of saying, okay, if that, that's fine, as long as you've got a physical explanation for this. And this is where you have things like the musings of Penrose mm -hmm. um, on gravity. So it could be that gravity, if you could include gravity, gravity in your quantum model enough, that little bit of whatever that does would be enough to, to, to help you get this quantum to classical transition. Um, there was an interesting model, very technical, I suppose, too technical for this discussion by Jared Milburn, called Intrinsic Decoherence. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not going to go into any details of it, but you, know, you could also argue that if that view is right, and I don't know what he thinks of that view any longer himself, um, so it's an interesting model with some interesting consequences that somehow there's some, if you like, fundamental decoherence built into the universe. If that was also the case, then that would be a mechanism to explain quantum to classical transition, um, but none of us really know. None of us know. We haven't figured it out. So there's, we, we have gone. Well, so, I mean, there, there's a, certainly a lot of theoretical work, and, and you mentioned before about things like that, the wave function being real, and, and I know there's some work from, from Dave Jennings and Terry Rudolph about this, um, about is, is the wave function a construct or is it a, is it a real object? Um, now, all of this is on the theoretical side. Do you see anyone or, or, or any groups worldwide that are trying to figure out a way anyway or is there any mechanism that anyone's ever proposed to try to discriminate between these interpretations well i don't think there can be at the moment because you need to be able to make different physical predictions so you could go from one so one extreme is the realist on the other end is something that's quite a new sort of set of ideas called quantum bayesianism which takes the ideas of bayesian statistics and applies them to quantum mechanics and becomes if you like 
to use the philosophical term, very positivist. Mm-hmm. So they are only concerned in the outcomes of experiments. They don't care what the underlying reality is in that respect. Whereas yeah. the real is obsessed with the reality of the wave function. Yet both views, to my mind, if you're going to model quantum systems from either perspective, you're going to end up with actually very similar mathematical models, if not identical. And if your mathematical models are identical, how do you distinguish between them in an experiment? Sure, sure. Um, so the, again, the foundations become important when generating new models. That's why we. So if you if you throw away some axioms and you've got a new set of axioms, you have a new model. So in your that, mind, that there there are no there are no disparate models of quantum mechanics that produce the quantum mechanics that we can measure, but yet still have technology aside, just in principle have the ability to discriminate between different interpretations of quantum mechanics. No, because otherwise we'd have been able to throw away some interpretations by now. Because if we could discriminate, we could have done some experiments. So there's lots of things in line. Well, I suppose more so versus practice versus in principle. I mean, certainly you can make predictions of a certain model that we just don't have the technological capability. And this will lead on to another question I'll ask in a few minutes. Okay. Um, but, But in principle versus in practice. Okay, so in principle, for example, if Gerard Milburn's intrinsic decoherence model is correct, mm-hmm. then what that would set is some sort of universal fundamental decoherence rate, as it were, that mm-hmm. any physical process. So if we, if we ended up getting our technology so good that every single physical quantum system that we find, be it superconducting, nitrogen vacancy centers in diamonds, nanomechanical resonators, all of these at some point suddenly show a decoherence rate that's the same, regardless of physical implementation, mm-hmm. then there's something fundamental. And that's, that would then be saying, oh, look, there's a, there's, a, there's a fundamental common decoherence process. So, okay, this jumps in quite nicely. So in the context of quantum technology, in the context of quantum computing, quantum computing is an error correction machine, mostly, um, the vast majority of what a quantum computer does is correcting its own errors. So if we could build systems that have, from a practical standpoint, a low enough intrinsic error rate to do the error correction, would these devices, and call them quantum memories, you know, quantum computers where we don't actually do an algorithm, whatever you will, would they, in principle, have a mechanism to, to identify some of these things? I'm not sure. Um, what, I, what I would say is that so some of the things we're in the, where the foundations and the engineering overlap are, so in terms of things like the measurement problem, mm-hmm. so one of the things I'm interested in, if we're going to throw away, say, measurement axioms, then we need to be able to reproduce the predictions of those measurement axioms. So what that means is you need to be able to model fully quantum mechanically measurement apparatus mm-hmm. operating in their classical limit, and you've got to understand that classical limit. If you can do that, all of a sudden you've changed the way you can engineer and design your measurement apparatus. So when you're building your quantum technology, you can model, and simulation modeling is fundamental to engineering. Sure. So if you look at the development of CMOS and VLSI and, and chip design, modeling and trying to get towards zero prototyping is, is deeply embedded in there. Mm-hmm. So if in our models we can actually model and build in measurement apparatus very accurately into the design, we can engineer better quantum devices and better quantum technologies. So regardless of the interpretation, if you like, the, the, the effort into modeling classical measurement apparatus within quantum mechanics so that we get that measurement chain mm-hmm. from the classical readout right the way down to the quantum dynamics and improving on that, that can have a, a, a nice impact on quantum technologies. Um, the other sort of things are in this engineering of the environment. So normally the environment is thought to mess up um, mess up systems. So you, you have a quantum system, it's quantum coherent, and decoherence and the environmental noise are usually thought of as being a bad thing. Yeah. Now, I think probably the earliest people to work on, on sort of out of view were people like Peter Knight and Barry Garraway, um, where they started to look at the effect of two photon absorbers on quantum systems. So if you have an environment where 
the decoherence is very special and it absorbs two photons at a time mm -hmm. rather than one at a time, then that environment can produce or will produce Schrodinger cap states, these spooky action at a distance states as a, a, a result of the decoherence. So instead of decohering to something not quantum in its operation, you decohere to something that's a very quantum thing. Right. So, and that's quite foundations linked into understanding the role of the environment. And where that leaks into technologies is for any given quantum technology, can we design an environment around that technology that makes it operate in a more quantum way? And you think uh, that could help solve these interpretational issues? I'm not sure it can help, no. Not necessarily, but it's where the, it's where the two areas link. Right. So I, don't think it, I don't think it will solve the interpretational issues, but people researching into one can apply that technique into the other. Okay. So I'm, I'm not sure you're going to resolve anything there, but it, it's quite... But it, it's also... So it's, it's sort of a, a link between some of the foundational questions and the effect of the environment, technology, and going right the way through, through to... If you like, this is sort of like a quantum version of design for reliability, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is a very classical systems engineering view, is you want to make your system reliable, you engineer it to be a certain level of reliability, and if you can engineer your environment to help you do that, that's part of an engineering process. Right. But I mean, with the interpretational issue, I mean, again, I'm, I'm not an expert in this stuff, and I, and I tend to stay very, very far away from it. Um, in the context, so many people might know sort of the, the intrinsic conflict that, that the general relativity has with quantum mechanics, and we're fairly confident that we don't have a full description of the universe because these two theories are in conflict. Yeah. Um, do you think that parts of quantum mechanics itself or, or, or potential reformalism of quantum mechanics on its own, rather yeah. than going to models that are compatible with general relativity, models that are compatible with gravity, if we were smart enough to come up with them, we could solve this purely within the realm of where quantum mechanics is most valid. Or do you really think that, okay, we need to solve these other unification problems before I think we, we have any hope? I think in order to overcome the foundation issues, we need to solve some of these other problems. Right. So, um, and they're all, right, so let me make it, I'm not a realist but I'm going to use realism because it's the easiest one to expand upon. Right. Okay, so it's not that I've... Um, so if you take a realist view and you throw away the three axioms, two or three axioms have you formulated, of, of, of measurement... Um, so as a, just as an example, give us, give us one of them. Sort of this is the projection yeah. hypothesis that after you've made a measurement, you are in. Oh, uh, how do you explain eigenstate? Well, what you, the, the the state of the system that's left over is identical to what you just measured. Yes. Yeah. So you've you've taken your big wave function, which is in this fancy quantum state, and you project it down into something which is in a definite state. Yeah, and that definite state is corresponding to what you just measured. Yeah. Exactly. So that that so. If you throw away that, then, then one, one of your issues, I suppose another way, is one of your issues in relativity is, or one of the things that leads to conservation of the wave function, the, the probabilistic interpretation of this, means that that thing has to be invariant. So if, if, you, take, if you take a probabilistic view of the wave function with Copenhagen measurement and all so this projection measurement, then when you're trying to unify with relativity, because this wave function represents the probability of your particle being somewhere, say, then that needs to stay invariant in different frames of reference. Right, so it's okay. about special relativity, is that I should measure the same thing no matter how fast I'm moving. Yeah. So, but that's not quite what you want in relativity. What you actually want, because you never see the wave function. We never, I've never seen a wave function. I don't think you have. No. In our, you know, apart from in our dreams. Um, yeah, dreaming of wave functions. Yeah, if we're dreaming of wave functions, we've got much bigger problems. Uh, in phase space, with the functions, but anyway. <laughs> um, 
so the, the important thing in relativity is not that the wave function to some extent is the same in each frame of reference, it's the outcome of any measurement. So if in one frame of reference, a photon counter makes a click, in all frames of reference, you need to see that click. Mm -hmm. That's what needs to be relativistically invariant. Right. Um, so if you could have a model where you threw away the measurement axioms altogether, you take the measurement axioms, throw them away, you unify your model with gravity, and within that model with gravity, you have a, a emulation, a, a, a way of reproducing those measurement, the outcome of those measurement apparatus by modeling you know, measurement system. So I actually put in my model, this is a photon counter. Okay, I actually put a real model of a photon counter. Then all that needs to happen within that model is if in one frame of reference, my photon counter produces clicks, in all frames of reference, it produces the same clicks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what the relativistic invariance does. And that might mean that you also no longer need to keep this normalization of the wave function because you're then taking a different view of what the wave function is. Right. Okay. So and, the normal, and normalization of the wave function is to make sure that all outcomes, at least something happens. Yeah. And if you're throwing away that, then that really opens up a whole very messy, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot to play with then mm -hmm. because you've, you've actually taken away four huge constraints from the theory. Uh, and those have major implications um, of a technical nature. So I, can't go into, I don't want to go into that. No, 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 of course not. Of course not. Um, but I mean, in terms, so you see potential linkages between this sort of technology sector that's uh, hopefully going to evolve over the next 10 or so years and potentially asking foundational problems. But you think it certainly goes beyond um, those of us who work in quantum mechanics. It really is a physics wide problem. It's, it's not just, you know, for those of us working in quantum technology who don't, you know, I, have, I haven't looked at general relativity since I was a fourth year university student and I have no intention of doing it again. <laughs> yeah, it's quite, yes, it's, um, yeah, and at the moment I'm not working directly on the, that side myself because mm -hmm. that, I think we need to have a bit more clarity about the directions we could possibly go because there are a lot of, as soon as you start throwing some axioms from one theory away, trying to merge them with another theory, there, there's so many degrees of freedom, it, it's not clear. So right at, at the moment we're, we're sort of, we're, we're looking at this stuff, but at the what we've, we're, we've got a lot of work now on trying to understand quantum mechanics better in phase space. Mm -hmm. But this is with Kinemoto and Todd Tilmer and, and, other, and other people, this sort of phase space method. Well, so, I mean, this pivots quite in as, as to the, the, the last little bit that we'll have a chat about, and that's namely exactly, you know, you call yourselves a quantum systems engineering group. So, obviously, this is a, is a function of, you know, hard, you know, real world technology it's not so much focused on uh, these more foundational issues so it, what are you guys trying to set up in Loughborough? um okay so we've got several interests and so uh, the question about what systems engineering is is a bit of a vague one because you ask two systems engineers you get three answers sure um so we've got several sort of things in mind so the first is the design for mentality so it's the, the view that when you're designing a quantum technology, a quantum application, that you start from thinking about what you want to produce. So you don't produce a laboratory demonstrator, prove a principle, and then realize you have to re-engineer it for a technology because you didn't take certain constraints, like the cost of the unit, the running cost, the maintenance, mm -hmm. the materials, into consideration from the outset. So this is where, if you want to do something, you, you, you take these design for tests, design for reliability, um, design for manufacturability, design for uh, you know, end of life cycle. Mm -hmm. So you start talking, thinking from the beginning about all these issues. Um, so we're doing quite a bit of work in that area. And so that this is, for example, leading to engineered quantum environments to make things more reliable. Right. Um, and there's other sort of, we're also messing, well, not messing around with, I suppose we are messing around. We're, we're, we're experimenting with taking other system views. So the, the, the softer side of things like taking requirement specifications, which is a, 
and and actually going through the sort of engineering process that you would see, for example, in the semiconductor industry, and seeing where you know where the parallels are, where things need to be extended. So, are you guys? Are you, are you do you have an experimental component, or are you basically? theorists or, or engineers i mean is it is there yeah. these sort of quantum hardware systems within loughborough or are you working with other people we have the beginnings of a reliability engineering lab so this is where we want to take things notions like accelerated failure so mm -hmm. the, the idea being here that you take a working quantum device you break it under controlled circumstances such as heating cooling heating cooling or vibration um, and you look at that device and you see how it breaks in a controlled fashion. And then you can improve the design once you and understand. Is, I mean, are these, are these working qubit systems? I mean, is, are you collaborating yeah, with, with very early days. So this is the very beginning of the program. So, so you know, it's, um, we, we, we have, we're in preliminary discussions with, with the group, group at Bristol at the moment, see if we've got room to collaborate there. Um, okay, so you'll take optics things from Bristol, you'll take iron trap stuff from Sussex, anybody who's building qubit systems and is willing well, to provide you something to break. That, that's what we hope. And what we also, you know, that's what, that's what we'd like to do. Um, and what we're, we're, what we're thinking will come out of this. So, in, so, for example, in... So there's, there's several examples about where quantum reliability and classical reliability have analogs and differences. Um, so what's the best example? Um, so what, what we're interested in is, is as the quantum devices break, how they break and what causes them to break. So in classical devices, you get things like, so in silicon, you get migration of the atoms along the chip mm -hmm. will eventually lead your silicon circuits to break and they'll stop behaving in their classical way. Mm -hmm. Quantum systems, something like that may be more important. There also may be other things. For example, you've got a, a, a quantum circuit based on superconductors. If your superconductor starts to fracture under stress, you may start to develop uh, these things called Josephson junctions, which mean you get other quantum phenomena happening. Um, and then there's, if you've got a, a quantum system that has several quantum components, there could be other interesting things that happen due to entanglement and mm -hmm. other very quantum things. So an example of where things like this are interesting in classical physics is something like electrostatic discharge. So if you have a, a, a semiconductor circuit and it builds up an electrostatic charge mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden it discharges, that discharge can break your circuit. Right, so basically you have a lightning strike that hits some yeah, other part of your chip. Yeah. Um, and what people find in classical systems engineering of these things this is an emergent phenomenon that if you take these chips and use the best possible components on an individual basis, so each individual component is as good as you can manufacture it, and you make your circuit with those, mm -hmm. that circuit is not as resistant to electrostatic discharge as one where you take components that are not necessarily individually the best, but they're designed better to work with each other. Mm -hmm. You get system level optimization rather than component level optimization. Yeah. And you can make your, your entire circuit much more resistant to electrostatic discharge by tuning your components. And it could be similar with quantum technologies, that we might need less than ideal things. So, for example, Bill, Bill Monroe, um, in some of his work, has found that he gets better results by not using the best qubits. Right, right. Uh, I think in one of his talks, he, he, he phrased it along, good plus good equals bad, and bad plus bad equals... Yeah, maybe good. Well, I mean, Bill's always eloquent. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the, the point behind that is, is people are already finding in quantum technology applications that using the best qubits, for example, may not lead to the best total operation. Yeah. So this is where you get a system design. And if you could combine... Um, so what we would like to see is a sort of whole field is the way where we look at the final product from the outset we design, or we, we get to the way where we can design each quantum circuit to take into account a circuit level optimization rather than a component level optimization. Mm -hmm. And we can enhance it by engineered environments. And we can do all these kinds of things and wrap it up into a sort of nice, nice neat 
um, strategy for engineering better. Little package, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, given certainly given that the context of what you guys are trying to do, um, this sort of leads into to the last couple of questions I'll have before we end things, is uh, where do you see the field is now? I mean, it certainly seems to be moving beyond the academic realm. This is not just a research project anymore. And I imagine you have industry contacts, industry partners, certain private money coming into this beyond, you know, just applying to EPSERC or some other funding body um, to do basic physics. Well, currently our, our main funding is coming from the uh, DSTL. DSTL, so, what's that? Defense. What's defense? Yeah. Um, so, no, it, it is. We're, we're at that tipping point. So, obviously, defense is interested around the world. This is the, the applications to cryptography and, and other things. Have, have, and defense are usually the early adopters of any new high risk technology. Mm -hmm. So, that, that's not a surprise. Um, but we've got, to, and, and big industry is interested. So, you've got obviously Google invested a lot of money, but you get increased interest in interesting people like Lockheed Martin, BAE Systems, but going right down to, um, to um, the medium-sized industry and small industry is, is getting very interesting. And if you look at the, if you look at any of the, the quantum technology hubs in the UK and their list of industrial partners, mm -hmm. there, there, there is, in, a, a lot of industry is now very, very aware. So we're on that tipping point. We're, we're on the point now where, where Google and Um, D Wave, I think, to some extent, they're, they're going to. Oh, there's D Wave, IBM. So, so quite a few players now. Um, I'm just, so I, I'm, I've got to be careful. Alex Agoskin, who's the founder of, of, of D Wave, is in the office next door to me. <laughs> um, so, you know, adiabatic quantum computing is interesting within its limited set of applications, mm -hmm. but you know, so it's not a universal quantum computer, but it looks like there's going to be success either with D-Wave or Google at some point. And that, that's very interesting. And that, that, that will prove principle. Quantum communications is, at least if you think about um, transmitting secure one-time pads and basic secure quantum um, communication protocols, that's pretty much in place. That's, that, that's happening. So you so feel that, that, you feel that you know that, that tipping point has been reach, reached, that cusp has been reached. This is no longer a fool's errand. This is not something that's sort of come into the scientific community. We've realised it's either economically too hard, practically too hard, politically too hard, and it's just going to fall by the wayside. This is something that's going to happen. I, I think there may be one or two things that we think will happen that won't. There will be things that we don't think will happen that will. Mm -hmm. Now there's the black swans. There, there'll, there'll be some of those, but I think things like quantum communications. That that's just that is now pretty much engineering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All the physics is in place. That's miniaturization, um, packaging. Uh, that that that's in terms of basic quantum setting up um, quantum next. Okay, we we don't have quantum repeaters, so you still need trusted nodes. Mm -hmm. So it's not a hundred percent quantum. Um, but in terms of having some quantum communication and quantum key distribution technologies, that, that's now a technology challenge, not a physics challenge. I mean, mind. that's one of the mandates in the UK, and I think the Chinese are building one. There's certainly private, if not defence contractors in the US that have this as a mandate. This seems to be going on quite yeah, extensively. So that's that's going to happen. Yeah. That, that's absolutely going to happen. Um, other interesting things like quantum simulation, which... I find very interesting because that that sort of feeds back into the systems engineering side is the is the testing certification mm -hmm. and validation. So if you take something like, I, I, in some ways, quantum simulation should be easier than building a quantum computer because it's like an analog computer, if you like, mm -hmm. quantum computer. And there you have applications to things like molecular modeling, and that links into drug discovery and all kinds of really cool things. Um, but the question there, when you don't have an algorithm and you don't have, a, you can't hope to model classically what your output is. How do you know that you're doing what you're modeling is a good model? 
Yeah, yeah, certainly from my own work, I mean, full-fledged quantum simulation actually appears to be harder than uh, things like factoring and, and stuff like that. But yeah. uh, maybe we'll come up with better techniques. But that's, that's where it, so, you know, if, if we could get to the point of doing drug discovery and modeling, after all, the best system to model, you know, chemicals are quantum systems. Mm -hmm. The best thing to model quantum systems is a quantum system. So if we could do this, the, the, what we could do for, for drug discovery would, would you know, orders of magnitude better than we can do today. You could, yeah. you could. Uh, well, we could, we could only hope so. And I suppose, you know, the hardware's got to come to a certain level before we reach that cusp. Um, so that's the long-term pipe dreams, I think. Um, but short-term technology, so sensors and communications. They're the big ones in your mind. Well, they're, they're the, they're the um, early wins. Right. Technologies. They'll be the early wins. And later down the line will come computing. So right now, you know, the, 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 you know, the, 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 unless, the, well, you never know. We, the thing in, in science is we view progress scientifically as polynomial. Um, it's been shown that scientific progress tends to be exponential. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we tend to be more pessimistic than we should be. Um, topological quantum computing, you know the constraints of what you need to build a quantum computer. Sure. And um, if that's realized, and I think this is, as, as Winnie um, uh, Sussex put it, you know, it, do, it won't matter if you need a nuclear power reactor and a lake to, to power it and a lake to cool it. If you can build a proper quantum computer, the military will provide the nuclear power reactor and the lake to cool it. Yeah, well, <laughs> at the very least for building one. Um, for building one. Yeah. And that's always a starting point. So if you think about early computers, you know, they needed warehouses. Um, but... So it, it could be that the computers are nearer than we than we think. I don't know. Um, so, but you certainly feel that, regardless of how long it takes, we're moving. We're moving yeah. there. This this thing's not going to fall apart in the next five years. Yeah, and, and somebody been, comes up with a completely fundamental theory about how this all this works and everything we've done for the last thirty years is wrong, which seems a bit unlikely. But I, th I think the chances of that are very small. Mm. Um, given some of the early, you know, the early successes, and unless there's some fundamental technological limitation we've missed, which I don't think so, it, it's a matter of time. Yeah, no, I agree as well. Um, so, so sorry. Well, one, one, one quick thing. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. The, the, what, I want to make an observation in mechanics, which I, I think may go by the wayside occasionally. Oh. <laughs> Uh, well, this is in support of Maquanics. It's not necessarily here to uh, to advocate for it. I know, but I, there's one thing I do want to, because it only occurred to me this morning, one of the reasons I think I've subconsciously liked it, is in the way you've designed it, you managed to get something as abstract as topological quantum computing, and you've coded it and presented an interface, which means the person who plays the game doesn't need to know a single thing about quantum mechanics. No, well, that's that's the goal, obviously. Well, the thing with that is, what you've managed to do there is actually a fundamental view of system, a fundamental approach of systems engineering. You've managed to remove the abstraction, so an end user can actually do some what is actually very hard quantum mechanics, knowing no quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so, I think in, in some ways, mechanics is an early example of this systems engineering approach. Now, it just occurred to me this morning, so. Well, no, I, I think that's true, and I think it, as, as your efforts will, will bear out and everyone else is doing things worldwide, is that you're going to have to do that. You're not going to train up. You know, look at the classical engineering community, 10,000, 100,000, a million people who do it. They're not going to all take six years of quantum theory. No. Uh, at least not in any time in the near future. I mean, maybe quantum theory becomes much more hardcore in high school in 100 years, but uh, it's not at the moment. Well, if we look at the way um, understanding of, of Maxwell's equations has, has been removed from electrical engineering degrees, what, what, what electrical engineers have managed to do is they've managed to remove the need to understand hardcore uh, classical field theory mm -hmm. in the design of, of electrical engineering components. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's so, a very good analogy. It's, it's our job to do the same with quantum mechanics, is to, is to get the need to... Uh, no, a, a quantum engineer doesn't want to be talking about foundations necessarily. No, I know. Remember, Dirac was an engineer, so yeah, yeah. 
No, you know, as I said, I stay away from foundations because it, it you know, I'm happy to read other people's work in it and I'm happy to read stories, but uh, otherwise it ties my head in knots. That's what makes it fun. <laughs> exactly. That's why I do it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so we're coming up on 50 minutes now, so I, I think we'll bring this to a close. So uh, just as a last thing, I mean, certainly uh, I've got links to uh, to your group down uh, in the low bar beyond the YouTube. Is there anything you want to plug? Um, Anything that's coming up at Loughborough that you'd like to advertise? Um, I wish I thought of that one before. Uh, <laughs> I, I didn't tell you that one beforehand. We, for, for EPSRC funded PhD students, I don't know if any are watching this, but we've got, uh, we're, we're doing with, with DSTL a, um, a quantum systems engineering summer school, um, but that's for EPSRC funded PhD students. Um, but that, that's a pre, you know, just to make them aware that that's happening. Um, apart from that, if you want to come and talk to us, come and talk to us. You know, we, um, I don't know. That's about it, really. Like, yeah, no, I'd second that. Um, certainly with, with the technology stuff that's happening in the UK and, and all the universities involved, um, you know, as I've said in, in previous podcasts and everything else I've written about this, uh, we need people that are just not physicists. Um, yeah. If you've got an interest in physics, great, but you don't need an interest in physics. We've got plenty of problems. If you're an electrical engineer, software engineer, systems engineer, anything involved in the classical world, you can definitely uh, come in and solve some pretty important things in quantum. So, in the, I've now just tried to think. so if anyone's interested in quantum reliability and wants to come and talk to us about that, we're also looking at 3D printing of quantum technology. So. I'm not talking about much about that, but if that interests anyone, they want to come and talk to us about either of those, then we'd be very happy to, to have Wonderful. Them. Wonderful. Yeah, so, I mean, in the low bar below, and obviously on our Twitter account and other things, there's links to, to the Loughborough group. Um, certainly get in contact with them. Uh, so, once again, uh, thank you, Mark, for, uh, for getting up early and, and having a bit of a chat with us about this. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. No problem. So, as I said before, uh, this podcast was started in order to support the McQuanix project on Kickstarter. There's only a few days to go, and unfortunately, it looks as though we're not going to hit our target. Um, maybe if you're a very, very rich person, um, you can donate what we need in the next couple of days. Uh, if not, we will still continue uh, the podcast, and we will still continue development of the game uh, through some other means. Uh, as I said, when we first started out today with Mark, uh, we're now available on SoundCloud and iTunes, so there are links in the low bar below. Please subscribe and please let us know what you think about this. As I said, this is uh, a podcast in order to try and, and, and get to the layperson a bit more of the expertise and a bit more of what's happening in this field. Um, we'll refine things and, and hopefully make things better and better as things go on. Uh, so once again, for those of you who joined in live, thank you. For those of you who have listened offline at some point in the future, uh, Keep subscribing to our Twitter feed. I'll let you know of the new people that we have every week. Um, my intention is to try to get one person at least a week, maybe one or two, depending on what's going on. We've got some good ideas for the future when it comes to talking to, to students and postdocs and the various groups of people working in this field. So thank you all again, and thank you, Mark. Thank you.